Um, so anyway, thanks, Josh. Um, as Josh mentioned, my name is Mike Boland. I'm chief analyst of artillery intelligence. And what I plan to do is to kind of go through what the AR investments and moves and product positioning of tech giants are, and really as kind of a leading indicator for a lot of the directions we see the AR industry going. So quick bit about me, I'm a 15-year uh, industry analyst. Uh, most of that uh, time, excuse me, covering mobile technologies. In the past three and a half years or so, uh, transitioning to ex exclusively cover AR and VR, including founding Artillery Intelligence. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar, Artillery Intelligence is a uh, market research and analyst firm. Um, it has typical kind of analyst firm deliverables, lots of published narratives, lots of data deliverables and forecasts. And we have a sister publication called AR Insider, which uh, publishes all the stuff on kind of a daily cycle. Um, and one of the things we do twice per year, and, and I'll make sure that th there's a lot going on here, I'll make sure these slides are available to you all. Uh, one of the things we do twice per year is a rather extensive market sizing exercise. And we see XR going to about uh, 56 billion um, in 2022. Um, and that consists of AR and VR and the enterprise and consumer segments of each. Um, and we are today mostly going to cover AR. Um, and if we were to break that out, it looks kind of like this, growing to about 45 billion by 2022. And there's lots of moving parts. There are lots of inputs. Um, this covers hardware. It covers software, both consumer and enterprise. Um, and it would take a whole presentation to kind of go into all the ins and outs of this. But I bring it up here sort of in light of our theme today in terms of one of the things of many that we look at are, are gut checks or what I like to call confidence signals. And one of those is the amount of spending happening um, by tech giants. Um, and this goes back to one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite uh, sports analysts, Tony Kornheiser. He's like, he likes to say, the answer to all your questions is money. Um, and so we like to follow the money. Um, so when you look at the big five, um, the, the companies represented here, the kind of you know, many tens of billions they're collectively spending um, on AR, um, it, it starts to paint an interesting picture. And it's not just the fact that they're spending that much as a confident signal to get to some of those forecasted figures, but moreover, like what, what are they doing? How are they doing it? And I like to ask the question of why. Um, when you look at their motivations, um, it, you kind of come to some interesting conclusions. Um, they're different for all of these players across the board, but there's one kind of common theme we've detected, which is that they're each driven to protect or grow or pave the future path for their core businesses. So for Apple, that's selling hardware. For Google, obviously, that's search and the ad revenues that are tied to search. For Facebook, that's similarly ad revenue, but tied to social engagement. For Amazon, it's you know, selling us stuff, e-commerce. And Microsoft, it's enterprise productivity. And all the things they're doing in AR kind of trace back to those core businesses. And the reason I think this is a valuable exercise is because of, like Josh mentioned, the gravitational pull of these companies to move markets and to just pull large swaths of the market along with them I think can help us triangulate where a lot of this is going and for you know, startups that are working on their own product roadmaps to kind of skate where the puck is going, so to speak. Um, so um, quick shout out before we kind of dive into each of those. Um, this is a subject of a report we did about six months ago and also a chapter we wrote for Charlie Fink's book, Convergence. Um, and uh, so let's, let's get right into it. So Apple, um, as I mentioned, its core business is selling hardware. It's really diversifying in a lot of ways, getting into more software and services, but the kind of core cash cow remains hardware and mostly iPhones. Um, so it has kind of like two vectors with AR. One is near term and one is long term. Um, and, and within the near term, um, AR kind of has two jobs at Apple. Um, the first one is to kind of make the iPhone sexy again. Um, you know, to justify premium pricing, the price keeps escalating, to provide a better feature set to kind of sell more phones. And that happens at a time when the iPhone is experiencing a lot of uh, quarterly sales revenue deceleration. Um, and it's not just the iPhone. If you look at all, all kind of smartphones, the, the sales are really slowing down because it's a very mature product reaching market saturation. So to make the iPhone kind of sexy again, move more units, but moreover, and, and this kind of falls on AR kit's shoulders to kind of condition the world for AR. Um, and so for developers with AR kit to be able to provide them a tool set to kind of gain their native footing for building spatial experiences. Uh, for users to be able to kind of like stimulate demand um, and get them used to this kind of you know, spatial type interface. And really it wants to have all those things in place in time for the iPhone's successor, 
which uh, are you know, likely going to be AR glasses. And we hear lots of rumors about kind of a 2020 time frame. I mean, that's like six months away. We believe it's gonna be closer to 2021, but we believe this is coming, following a lot of the kind of, like the, the IP filings and acquisitions made by, Apple's, uh, made by Apple, excuse me, and a lot of those types of clues. Now, just like with you know, mobile AR, it has two jobs. We believe this will also have kind of two jobs at Apple, one of which, is to, again, be kind of a succession plan for the iPhone and counterbalance some of that slowing sales of an aging iPhone. Um, but more importantly, um, to essentially make the iPhone more important or increase the reliance on the iPhone. I think the clear model that a lot of us agree that they're gonna have in terms of glasses, if these glasses come, is to be iPhone tethered. Whether that be an actual wire or whether it be wirelessly, the point is that the kind of, the, the heavy lifting and, and the compute power, CPU, GPU, um, happening in, with the phone that's already in your pocket. And I think that increases the importance and reliance upon that device. Um, and then also allows Apple a little bit of kind of design leeway to kind of offload a lot of that power to the device in your pocket. Um, a, a lighter bill of materials to design the phone. Um, and it doesn't have to sell you two different devices because you are, you're already carrying the one that's gonna uh, handle some of that kind of compute heavy lifting. So that's gonna allow Apple some advantages there based on the way it's already positioned. Um, and, and then that's kind of pursuant to the longer, longer term, where it's more about kind of like a suite of wearables that has this kind of holistic augmentation, whether it be line of sight graphics with glasses, whether it be biometric tracking and information delivered to your wrist with an Apple Watch, or whether it be um, you know, audio signals, textured audio that's kind of delivered to your ear. Um, and it's already planting the seeds for that. If you consider um, AirPods, it sold 40 million of these last year, and it's really proving the hardware use case and conditioning that use case. If you consider that you know, it, it, the cultural acclimation for glasses is probably gonna take a little bit longer. It's proven that people already are wearing these. I mean, I'm wearing them right now. Um, and you just kind of see them everywhere. So that's one kind of clue that it's going towards that more kind of holistic, wearables type, broader sense of augmentation. Another clue is in its screen time app, and this may be a long shot, but it's starting to kind of wean us off that like, you know, downward held device type of kind of use case. And it really wants to, you know, all together just position itself um, as a central point of our kind of personal computing lives, as it's always done and kind of looking towards what that's gonna look like in five years. Um, so moving on to Facebook. So Facebook's core business, again, that theme of like, you know, these moves tracing back to the core business, Facebook's core business is uh, advertising through kind of social interactions. Um, and like Apple, uh, that's kind of taking two different tracks, near term and long term. In the near term, um, it likewise has kind of two jobs. The first one is to keep us in that walled garden longer, which is a key KPI for Facebook and its monetization model in terms of increasing the average revenue per user and serving us more ads, it's been able to show that the engagement levels of things like AR lenses boost session lengths. Um, but more importantly, to use AR to actually monetize directly in using things like AR lenses as an ad unit, um, because it turns out that AR is very good at demonstrating products and product attributes in very immersive ways. Um, I like to say on faces and in spaces in terms of like the front facing camera for you know, various accoutrements and you know, cosmetic items and, and, and also just the broader range of things that you can put in you know, the space with the rear facing camera. Um, and it's actually working so far. So we track all kinds of ad campaigns that are you know, employing different flavors of AR, uh, mostly around these kind of AR lenses, branded AR lenses. Um, and here's just you know, six or seven of them. And I won't read through all of these, but in some cases you can see that it can achieve a 10x uh, delta in terms of user engagement, um, which are pretty strong signals for how well this is working. Um, and another thing that advertisers are really starting to like is that it's possessing a very, a very rare thing, which is to be a full funnel advertising format. So you have the, the purchase funnel, as we call it, which maps to the kind of consumer journey. And at the top, you have impression-based advertising. It's like you know television advertising, display advertising. And at the bottom of that funnel, you have more direct response, um, actionable ads, things like search, 
uh, very high intent type of media. So this is kind of spanning that funnel in some ways, and this is a good example. This is a Facebook campaign from Michael Kors, where you have the kind of high reach display ad on the left that is distributed through the news feed. It has a call to action that lets you then go one step down the funnel and try on the glasses. And then finally, yet another step down the funnel and actually purchasing them right there on the spot. So that kind of full funnel um, capability is, is pretty rare in terms of ad formats. Um, same thing, here's another example. This is from Nike. This is through Facebook Messenger. It distributed um, a banner ad to, it blasted it out to all of its followers on Messenger, um, which then allowed users to unlock the rear-facing camera um, AR animation of this is the Kyrie 4 shoe drop, and then you could buy it on the spot. And the result here is they actually sold out of inventory in less than an hour. Um, and it's really starting to scale as well. So when you add up uh, Messenger, uh, Facebook Newsfeed, and Portal, it served one billion AR lens engagements. Um, and, and the kind of sleeping giant here, and what we believe is next, is Instagram. Um, so, for, um, so far, there's been a closed beta for its Spark AR platform to build AR lenses um, for Instagram. It just opened that up to the rest of the world, and we believe that's gonna be an inflection point, not just because of Instagram's scale, but also it's a good kind of product market fit because you know, Instagram being very visually oriented, being an increasingly large distribution for, point for things like stories, where, where AR is very conducive, um, so that's something to look out for. Uh, this leads to some of our market sizing for advertising revenues in AR. Uh, we see that growing to two, almost 2.5 billion by 2022, growing from about uh, just over 400 million last year. Um, that's pretty healthy growth, but this is still a drop in the bucket when it comes to global ad spend. Um, and, and most of this so far has actually been, like in, in, in 18 and so far in 19, it's actually mostly been Snapchat because it has a little bit of an earlier lead, but we believe Facebook is gonna catch up to it and eclipse that due to Facebook's operational scale of about 1.5 billion um, global users on mobile. Um, and then long term. Um, so everything I mentioned so far for Facebook is short term. Long term, it really wants to be the identity layer for the spatial web, just like it kind of uh, positioned itself as the identity layer for the 2D web and the social graph. Before Facebook came along, the kind of concept of like identity as a currency really just wasn't a thing yet. And it really wants to double down on that and just project forward to the, the spatial era. And what this could look like sometime, someday, and this is again longer term, um, are spatial annotations that kind of follow you around, things that you sh choose to share and with whom. Um, information about yourself, some of the th same fodder that's part of like your, you know, your profile on Facebook, but kind of following you around spatially, um, and lots of other just kind of ways to um, have that render in physical space. Um, and then longer term, advancing VR. So as we all know, Facebook is very vested in VR based on its Oculus acquisition and the many billions it's spent since then in terms of developing the product and, and the hardware. Um, it believes, and, and uh, CTO Michael Abrash, uh, or CTO of Oculus Michael Abrash, will often talk about how the hard problems they need to solve in the nearer term with AR really get them closer to some of the things they want to be and where they want to be with VR, given that it shares a lot of the same kind of technological underpinnings um, and could someday kind of converge. Um, and then Google. Um, so Google's, again, the kind of theme of what's, what's the core business. Google's core business, of course, is search and ad revenue tied to search. Um, everything it's doing in AR really kind of traces back to that in a lot of ways, the things it's building, the models it's building. Um, and I like to think about it as, as building an internet of places. Um, you know, Google has, of course, you know, positioned itself as a powerhouse online by indexing the, the web. Um, and it wants to do the same thing in the kind of spatial web, and it's very strongly positioned to do so, given that it has you know, its knowledge graph, it has you know, image recognition capabilities with its visual database, it has like increasing machine learning capabilities, um, and really starting to kind of build an AR cloud out, out of these existing assets. And that's taking form in a few different ways. So visual search, this is Google Lens. Uh, many of you might be familiar with this. You point your phone at something, and then it kind of contextualizes it or gives you inf informational overlays or search results based on what that thing is. Uh, it's a lot more intuitive than typing in certain use cases in certain contexts. And this really follows a pattern for Google of you know, in the smartphone era, it's doing more and more to increase the touch points with users, pursuant to increasing its search query volume, which is a key kind of KPI for Google. 
Um, and you know, it's doing that with voice search and Google Assistant. This is kind of just more things along those lines of increasing search query volume. But it's not just volume. If you look at qualitatively also, um, a lot of these visual searches have the propensity to be high value, highly monetizable searches if you're talking about products. Um, like taking you know, a Google Lens um, shot of you know, someone's shoes you see on the street and wanting to know where to buy them, fashion items, in, in retail establishments and those types of contexts. Google's very keen on you know, that, that aspect of this. Another thing Google's very keen on is uh, local discovery. So throughout the kind of smartphone era, it's been able to prove that the proximity between searcher and search subject can tend to boost some of its key KPIs like click-through rates and user intent and the, the click value and CPCs. Um, so it really sees this as a way to you know, amplify AR because in AR's case or in visual search, it, you know, the, the search subject is not you know, just within proximity, it's, it's literally within view. So that user intent, Google is kind of salivating over what that could mean in terms of like high value advertising. Uh, it's also doing this indoors. Um, so you know, after you find the restaurant you're looking to, more kind of granular use cases of using Google Lens to contextualize a menu by you know, utilizing, again, some of the assets it already has. Like it's pulling from Google My Business, Google listings, uh, reviews, images, um, and being able to do that. Um, it actually, this is something it announced at Google I.O. and it announced yesterday that it's now available. And I tried this on a few menus and it wasn't activated yet or it wasn't working, but I encourage you to try it. And I think it's gonna take them a while to do the image recognition and the you know, image of databases, uh, sorry, the image database of uh, menus. Uh, but this is gonna be really cool when, when, it, when it actually comes out. And this is very Google in terms of like putting stuff out there before it's totally complete. But um, I think this, this is gonna be cool when, when they nail it. So um, visual positioning service, similarly, you may have already seen this. This is something where it's kind of you know, spatially anchored, directional symbols for urban navigation. Um, I think this is gonna be, again, more, I don't know, lucrative and you know, I think a more compelling use case when they take it indoors. Um, and, and this represents something that, that I like to think of as Google's last mile. Um, you know, finding things, it wants to position itself in that last mile to the cash register. When you're in a real retail location to be able to navigate, to be able to get product information. One challenge that Google has always had is that search lives many steps away from where a transaction happens when it happens offline. Online, it's easy. It can do that clickstream analysis and be able to tell if something was bought online, but not so much offline. And to put some numbers behind that, if you look at e-commerce, it's, it's about one-tenth of the amount that's spent on you know, US retail spending, uh, which is about 3.7 trillion um, in terms of total retail sales, but that's increasingly influenced and driven by digital technology, especially mobile, which happens to the tune of about a trillion dollars in US spending that's happening offline, but driven and influenced through mobile engagement. And Google believes that this is where AR will take the biggest bite, and it really wants to have that use case of a digital interaction that leads to an offline conversion, and it knows that AR kind of does that because it literally, the interface combines the two, and it really wants to own that. Um, and then it's, it's already working in terms of user traction. Um, so this is our survey we do yearly with Thrive Analytics, um, and we ask all kinds of questions about AR usage, mobile AR usage. This is a question that asks, for those who indicated they do use mobile AR, what are the types of things they're doing? And not surprisingly, you see gaming and uh, social lenses in the lead. But visual search, it's interesting. This says a lot that 24% of people are using it because Google has not really distributed it yet, but people are still finding it. Um, it's gonna increasingly start to put it more front and center in the search flow. This was a key theme at Google I.O. a few weeks ago. Um, and as that happens, I believe that usage is gonna go up. Um, I think it's also important to note that that kind of aligns with a thesis we have, which is in the kind of the next stage of mobile AR. A lot of the, the use cases that win or as we get closer to killer apps are gonna be things that are less sexy and less kind of novelty driven, like everything that we've seen so far, um, and more just kind of boring utilities that solve everyday problems. Um, and not only that, but those that have the propensity for high frequency, what I like to call all day use cases, which kind of like search itself in terms of its, its frequency. Um, so I believe that's where kind of Google is shooting for here. Um, Amazon is next. So Amazon's business, as we know, is selling us stuff and e-commerce. It sees AR as a way to um, better qualify products, um, create a more informed purchase through these overlays. It's similar to what we talked about earlier with Facebook in terms of you know, qualifying products, but in this case through Amazon's kind of commerce flow. Um, 
and not only kind of increase commerce in terms of where, what Amazon's going for here, but also reduce returns, which is kind of a margin depleting phenomenon for Amazon, which is a company that has such thin margins to begin with. Um, this is a stat not from Amazon, but others we've talked to that with AR guided transactions, the return rates can be as low as, as, low as um, under 3%, which is really good in e-commerce terms. Um, and then you know, more broadly speaking, Amazon, sorry, Amazon wants to be the commerce layer. Just like we talked about Facebook being the identity layer, Google being the knowledge layer, Facebook, I mean, sorry, uh, Amazon wants to be the commerce layer. And the way it's going about it is a lot of different ways. But next up, we believe, is visual search. It's already doing that in a partnership with Snapchat, uh, which you can see on this screen, um, utilizing its kind of product database, but through the front end of Snapchat and to Snapchat's very camera forward audience. We believe it's testing the waters there, and we're predicting that Google, or sorry, uh, I keep screwing up their name, Amazon is going to uh, launch something similar as kind of a feature within its flagship, mo flagship mobile app uh, in the near future. Um, and then Sumerian. This is kind of a bit, a bit departed from um, e-commerce, but it similarly kind of falls into the theme of AR serving these kind of existing businesses and amplifying them. So Amazon Sumerian is under the AWS umbrella. Um, you may know it already. It's, it's a low barrier, low cost tool to create AR and VR and 3D experiences. So for example, a lot of brands use this to build virtual avatars that um, are for kind of like customer service type contexts. Uh, but what Amazon's doing here is interesting, or what AWS is doing here is interesting. It knows that AR experiences and VR experiences and 3D experiences are gonna be very uh, bandwidth heavy and storage heavy and graphically intensive. And these are all the things that AWS caters to. So it's essentially seeding its own market with this low barrier tool and bringing more kind of companies into its ecosystem where it will kind of monetize downstream through AWS subscriptions, uh, which is kind of a smart long-term play here. Um, and next is Microsoft. And, and, and I should say last but not least, I, I kind of put them last because they're clustered in an enterprise category, but, but I think one of probably one of the most fascinating of the five um, in terms of taking its competency in you know, workplace productivity and kind of parlaying that into like the spatial computing era by just being a powerhouse when it comes to enterprise AR. Um, and I like to think of Microsoft in this respect as the comeback kid in the respect that you know, in the last tech revolution, the mobile revolution, Microsoft failed to position itself as a direct touch point to the user. Um, in terms of either a hardware device or its operating system, Windows Mobile, which in early days just lost a lot of share to Android and iOS and then kind of retracted from the market. So that's a position it doesn't want to be in again, um, and it's really come out of the gate swinging in this kind of spatial computing era, um, and, and it's really become the gold standard in terms of hardware um, in the HoloLens and now the HoloLens 2 in terms of that uh, enterprise uh, AR use case. And it's not just the hardware. I think the hardware is a toehold for this kind of expanding stack that it's doing a really good job building. Um, and, and this, ironically, as a side note, is kind of the, the vertical software and hardware integration by which its longtime nemesis Apple rose to power like 30 years ago. Um, and, and really that, that kind of, you know, that vertical integration, you have HoloLens as the hardware, you have Windows Mixed Reality as, you know, the operating system, you have the the uh, application layer um, that's ex increasingly expanding with things like spatial anchors and uh, layout and remote assist and these programs that are kind of common use cases in enterprise AR, especially um, those that are happening in industrial settings. Um, and then more importantly, Azure, um, as really like the, the cloud backbone for that to deliver secure information for all this data that's gonna populate all these uh, enterprise AR experiences. And, and I like to look at that as just like we looked at you know, Facebook and being the identity layer and um, uh, Google as the knowledge layer and Amazon as the commerce layer, Microsoft really being that enterprise productivity layer uh, with the help of, of Azure and, and this whole stack. And it's not just owning the stack, but Microsoft's positioning in terms of just knowing enterprise software, knowing how it's sold, knowing the, the cadence of the buying cycles and, and all of that intelligence really just positions it for a uh, leading position in enterprise AR. Um, so that's it for the big five, but I, I wanna also give like a, like a caveat or a disclaimer to all that, which is that you know, all of those players and the, like the gravitational pull 
they have to really sway the trajectory of all this doesn't necessarily they're going to mean they're going to be the winners in the next era. We could have you know a, a new Big Five or a new cast of characters 10 years from now. And I think that there are a lot of players emerging now that have some advantage in terms of their native product focus or you know, being born into this spatial computing era. Um, and I think there's also something to be said for at least some folks on, on that list of five that might be challenged because when we're talking about AR and spatial computing, there is you know, acute location tracking, there's spatial mapping, there's these things that are gonna really be a privacy minefield. So data collection, the data collection challenges and what we're hearing about now in the 2D web are gonna be nothing compared to the, those kind of conflicts that we see um, in the 3D web. And you know, so anyone that has a legacy model that incentivizes data collection for advertising, i.e. Google and Facebook, might face some headwinds in terms of the you know, privacy challenges, the user trust they're gonna have to gain. Um, so, so those are just a few kind of factors there. And you know, I just put a, a couple logos on here, but there are of course so many companies in, in this industry that could kind of rise and, and challenge these players or, or be part of the ecosystem. It's not just gonna be a zero sum game, it's gonna be a rich ecosystem. But um, I guess I just want to uh, reiterate that those five players may not be the same five players five years from now. Um, so um, for the reading, I actually showed this before. Um, if you're interested in Charlie Fink's book, we wrote a chapter in there, the report we wrote. And then as like a parting gift, if anyone's interested in an artillery pro subscription, um, feel free to use this discount code, artillery. Um, and that's the URL. Um, and that's it. Um, so thank you for listening. Um, do, do we have time for questions? <laughs>